Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the GP Technology Theater at SC12. At this time, I'd like to introduce Ray Grout from NREL, the National Renewable Energy Lab. Thanks. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about for the next uh, few minutes is the work in the context of readying one of the Department of Energy applications for Titan. And this work we did at the request of Oak Ridge National Labs, they're contemplating acquiring their new machine. And as a uh, collaboration between a relatively small but uh, diverse team, so myself, I'm a mechanical engineer turned computer scientist. Uh, Ramanan Sankaran is a Oak Ridge employee. He's uh, worked on this project for a long time, uh, also with a combustion background. Uh, John Levesque from Cray is obviously more on the computer science end of things, as are Cliff and Stan from NVIDIA. Uh, Jacqueline Chen from Sandia has been the steward of S3D for most of her career in the past several <laughs> several decades. Um, in terms of NREL's involvement, I don't know if anyone's, everyone's familiar with NREL. We're a lab, our primary mission is on renewable energy and energy efficiency, uh, but we also have interests in all of the fundamental science that, that underpins effective research in those areas, which is where this project fits in. Just by way of outline, um, we spend a bit of time on the science challenges that S3D is really targeted at, uh, why we're interested in research in this area, and where we hope the code can deliver sort of in the next few years and longer term as well. Out of that falls uh, performance requirements for the near term. And I'll spend a little bit of overview just to give you a flavor for the, the type of optimizations and refactoring that we did uh, to go into that. and wrap up with sort of what we can do now and, and where we're going in the future. So in terms of why combustion, so the challenge of combustion science, we have national goals to reduce energy consumption uh, in terms of petroleum usage and emissions, and we really get most of our energy in this country by through combustion, one source or another. It's both transportation and buildings. Um, and we're in this space right now where there's not only a driver to really reduce that, that consumption, but also where there's an evolving fuel stream. So there's a lot more interest in, in biofuels right now, engineered fuels, and there's a big opportunity to understand the interplay between some of these engineered fuels and novel combustion concepts and, and look for an optimal solution in that space. Um, interesting complication is that a lot of these, these new developments put us directly in a space where the traditional engineering models aren't particularly valid and it's really where we could use some more fundamental science. So that's the, the sort of spot S3D falls into. This is my sort of one combustion slide uh, without any numbers on it. So you can think of this as a regime diagram for turbulent combustion. So down along the, um, along the orbit in the bottom right is uh, a regime where the, there's a very well-structured flame and relatively benign turbulent mixing. So this is a, a regime in which chemistry dominates, and it's very well, relatively well understood and there's very effective engineering level models for this, this type of combustion. Um, up closer to this side is a regime where turbulence and mixing and the fluid mechanics tend to dominate the problem, and the, the coupling with chemistry is, is uh, looser and there's less, less structure in the species. And that's also a regime where we have pretty decent engineering level models. Um, However, a lot of these new devices fall into the intermediate regime where things aren't terribly well understood. So that's what we're trying to do with S3D is do very detailed, careful simulations right in that regime so we can, can probe that, the, the physics in that area and build some fundamental understanding that we can use to develop new engineering models. And just as a prelude to something I'll talk about later, the uh, I guess the intensity of the turbulence uh, is characterized by this quantity called turbulent Reynolds number. And the only really important thing for the purpose of this talk is that it varies uh, weekly with the total number of grid points. So we tend to think of this, if we want to increase the turbulent Reynolds number of our simulation, we have to make the grid a lot bigger to get the right resolution. Um, but it also means for the purpose of fitting into a machine, if we adjust the number of grid points a small amount, there's going to be a relatively small effect on the Reynolds number. Okay, so to do this, uh, it's a continuum simulation. We're looking at solving the compressible Navier-Stokes augmented for reactive flow. 
um, have a chemical reaction network that governs uh, compositional changes, um, a mixture average transport model, some flexible thermochemical descriptors, and then um, of particular interest to sort of hybrid computers, there's a bunch of case-specific physics that are what I throw in the bucket of other stuff, the sort of non-flow, non-chemistry, uh, things like uh, radiation, uh, particle tracking, and these are things that tend not to map terribly well onto, onto the GPU. In terms of numerics, uh, S3D implements a method of lines solution, so we replace all the spatial derivatives in our PDEs with finite difference approximations. Uh, in this case, an uh, eighth-order centered approximation, so it has a wide halo, so it's every, every good point we're looking at, we're looking at four points on either side of it, and we integrate this explicitly in time. It's a fourth-order, six-stage Runge-Kutta time integrator. Um, there's a lot of point-wise work in terms of thermochemistry, and then uh, the traditional uh, block spatial parallel decomposition between MPI ranks. Um, skip over that. So the, the sort of with a forecast, started this project two years ago and anticipated that the science problem that would be relevant when Titan acceptance was complete was to look at the details of the flow in a regime relevant to HCCI combustion. And this is a, a regime that's relatively homogeneous with uh, some perturbations injected into the initial conditions. Um, so this particular problem, we're looking at a 52 species uh, chemical mechanism, but the fuel being uh, heptane, based on a target size of approximately two billion grid points, and looking at the it's the size of Jaguar, the then large machine we're running on, uh, that works out to 48 cubed points per node, and in an MPI everywhere framework, that would uh, be 20 cubed points per core. So we use this to look at the strategy of how we we're going to set this up on Titan. It gives us sort of a concrete anchor for our, 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 our thoughts. Um, but that's in the context of, of knowing that the, the science is changing while we're waiting for the machine to be delivered. So I want to keep in mind there's evolving chemical mechanisms. Um, more recently, it looked like there was going to be a 73 species mechanism would be the relevant mechanism. Um, but these sort of change as we're going along. So we, we carried on with our initial benchmark, keeping in mind that we'd want to be able to have everything we do adaptable to a, a different physical situation. Okay. Uh, and then it's a, took, we estimated it's going to take about 500,000 time steps to, to resolve the, the temporal length of this. So just pausing there briefly uh, to emphasize from the science perspective, we've got a code that's, that's well targeted to provide specific solutions that answer questions of interest to developing the engineering science to let people actually go out and build one of these devices. Um, we have a situation where we can adjust the grid point slightly and have a weak dependence, uh, weak adjustment only to the, the physical regime we're simulating. And we have a chemical mechanism that we think is about the right size. It might be a little bigger, a little smaller. Um, and that has implications in the sense that these chemical mechanisms, the uh, size of the state, uh, so the, the amount of register pressure varies very dramatically with the size. So I'm gonna keep that in mind. Um, so this is what S3D looks like from a performance perspective um, back on Jaguar. So this is just breaking down the, the balance of work. About 40% of the computational effort is in evaluating chemical reaction rates. Um, next biggest piece is on transport coefficients. Uh, this right-hand side, I'll show you in the next slide what's in there, um, but it's a basically a, a large collection of fairly low flop operations, and then there's a bunch of other stuff that's relatively small. Um, this, this slide is kind of interesting. If you look at the, the table in the top right, we have uh, time per time step, wall clock time per time step. On a fairly high density uh, grid, it scales very well. As we start pushing that down to very low numbers of grid points per core, even with the traditional MPI code, we're getting into this regime where the communication was starting to affect the scaling. 
So just run through quickly what the right hand side looks like. It's basically a, a linear tree where we're evaluating a, a bunch of fairly lightweight things. So the, we're solving intrinsically for density weighted variables. We need to extract primitive variables. We solve for energy. We need to extract temperature. So that's a solve for temperature in a polynomial expression. And traditionally, we tabulate those polynomials to ex accelerate that. Um, so thermodynamic properties, equations of state. There's a bunch of, we have to compute the gradients of all these things. So this is where we have payload data and communication. Um, the transport efficiencies these are also in terms of polynomials. These ones we don't tabulate, they're only evaluated once, so they're evaluated directly. Um, fluxes, and the important thing to note here is the fluxes go into uh, spatial derivative terms. Now we're going to take a derivative of something we've already taken a derivative of, so there's two, two pieces of communication. And then finally, chemical reaction rates, evaluating these, remember this was sort of 40% of the work, and these things are uh, expressions that are, this, uh, it's called an Arrhenius form, uh, it's exponential heavy, and then it's effectively random access. So you evaluate a bunch of reaction rates and then assemble those into net species creation and destruction rates um, through a weighted summation. Um, as an added little wrinkle, the, because we're sort of pushing the bounds of what's possible computationally, rather than using complete chemical mechanisms. Uh, in this case, we're actually using chemical mechanisms that, are, that are where the vi very rapid time scales are put into partial equilibrium in based on the local diffusive time scale. So what that means, we look at the flow conditions. If there's chemistry that's happening really fast and doesn't need to be coupled to the flow solution, we decouple that on the fly. And there's some, some papers on this um, from a, a I guess from a programming perspective, it adds another derivative. So there's yet another piece of communication in here that's embedded in the solver. So taking all that in, into account, we came up with this migration strategy um, to look at requirements for the host accelerator work. And I'll show you in the la last slide that we've, we've decided to take the pr approach of moving the entire flow and chemistry solver onto the GPU. And that leaves the CPU more or less idle um, but it's a nice place to have, a nice tool to have available for all those bits of optional case-specific physics that we may only be using one, one or once or twice, and it may not be worth the effort of moving that over a GPU, because how we already have the CPU code. Um, profile the legacy code, I just showed you that. We extracted a bunch of key kernels for optimization. These were the, sort of the, the top four or five things in terms of overall execution time. And we prototyped and explored the performance bounds of those using CUDA. We got to this point and realized we're already having these scaling problems, even in the non-GPU, the CPU world, where we're do when we're doing MPI everywhere. And in order to prepare for the, the future mini-core era, we wanted to hybridize S3D, so it was a two-level MPI plus OpenMP parallelism strategy. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. And we wanted to do that in order to give us a good CPU code that's performance portable and then use these OpenACC directives to, um, to build the GPU version. And then optionally, we left in as an option to restructure and to move a bit of the work back to the CPU. Turns out we did that for a while and we aren't anymore because we have lots of other of these sort of monitoring diagnostic things to keep the CPU busy. Um, I'm gonna skip that, but the, the point of this is just that with the chemistry term, it does, it's relatively flop heavy, but it's also very, very state heavy. Um, and this is something we found was both interesting and really was is limiting our performance still in that the number of registers required to do the, the chemistry limits the amount of concurrency we can get out of the code in that, in that part of the solver. So we did a quick pen and paper analysis. So this was, remember, a benchmark problem and then we also looked at a larger reaction mechanism in terms of the, the temporary storage that's required to, to go through an entire time step iteration. Um, turns out that for a given grid size, we're well under what's available on the GPUs we anticipated having, and we're, it'll fit quite comfortably. So that's a kind of a reassurance that we can move everything over and not worry that we're gonna get stuck in a position where it won't fit. 
Um, I'll just give you a flavor for some of the reorganization we did. So, it's typical in the, in the sort of original S3D code, it's a lot of loops. So this is a loop over all of the species where the strategy for hiding communication um, was to initiate sends and then do calculation on the interior of the local, local domain, then wait for the communication to, to finish and evaluate the, the points on the edge that needed the halo data. And that was, has been fairly effective up until now. It doesn't lend itself well um, towards aggregating communication and, and overlapping communication with compute when the compute uh, required to do the interior isn't sufficient. So we restructured a lot of these things um, at the expense of some more, more scratch memory to, to do the sends and then, um, and then wait and then do all of the, the derivative evaluation. The reason that's interesting is because in the overall flow of the code, so we now have two main regions. So at the beginning of the, the time step loop, we go through this process where we pack and send uh, the halos for the gradients, and then we go do the thermodynamic properties. So we go away and do something entirely unrelated, and then when it comes time to use that halo, we come back and do it all at once. And then again, later on, um, down here, we're going to assemble the operands, pack and send, uh, compute the derivatives, and this all being blocked up gives us an opportunity to move the reaction rates into the, into the between the communication events and when that data is used. Um, we found that to be very, very effective at, at hiding communication, both inter-node and between the node and the GPU. Um, some other example optimizations we're doing, uh, optimizing for computing gradients. Uh, traditionally, this was done sequentially, so X, Y, Z directions, all of which are a, a loop over, over the same data, different directions. Um, we've now fixed that up so that we loop over the data once and, and compute the three directions over the, in one pass. Let's step back. So this is some pretty major changes to, um, it's not a large code in terms of CFD solvers, but it's still, there's still a close to 100,000 lines of code in this, and we're making some structural changes. One of the nice things about the hybrid approach and using directives, at least from my perspective, is that I find it a lot easier to debug OpenMP codes than I do GPU codes, and we can get a lot of stuff correct there, and then when we move to the GPU, that there's some, there's less things to debug. And the other approach that we found very useful is using uh, a suite of physics-based tests that on Ensemble exercise different parts of the physics. So the idea is that we can run this, and if it runs and it's not quite right, we can look at what the result is and guess what, where things are going wrong. And that really narrows it down without having to do a lot of manual debugging. So just an example, so we, one of the tests we do is we put a pressure pulse in the middle of the domain, and there's an acoustic wave that propagates out. When it hits the boundaries, it should propagate out symmetrically, um, but it doesn't, for instance, if there's a, a lack of symmetry at one corner of the domain, that's a good hint that there's something wrong with the boundary conditions up there. Or if you see a, you know, a, a artifact along boundaries between processors, that's a good indication there's something wrong with their communication. Um, just gonna wrap up that section. So we did significant restructuring to expose node-level parallelism and develop this hybrid MPI OpenMP code. Once we'd done that, it was relatively straightforward to add OpenACC directives to move the communication onto the GPU. Changed the balance of effort a little bit. Um, and in some cases in the pure CPU version, at very low, very simple com com chemical complexity and very small grid point per nodes, we it's actually suffered a, a pretty major performance degradation because we we're in this space where previously we would fit into low levels of cash and we're now spilling over. Um, turns out that's not a particularly advantageous or realistic place to run anyway, so we're not too worried about that, but um, it's just a kind of a observation. Um, let's give her just a reminder of our target science problem. So this is measured performance that was measured couple days ago. This is on a pre-acceptance Titan machine. Um, so it's our wall clock time per time step and the number of nodes and GPUs. 
So our baseline on Jaguar, the, the single Opteron machine, is up around seven seconds. The OpenMP code running only on the Opteron core, or chip using all the cores on Titan, settles in somewhere around four to five seconds per time step. Um, and the GPU code is, is down comfortably under two seconds per time step. So this is using, executing primarily on the GPU and using the Opteron more or less just for, for bookkeeping and I.O. purposes. Um, in terms of ter what that means, so there's, you notice this line runs out to 12,000 nodes. We haven't gathered data out to the full size of the machine yet, um, but we will. Even at 12,000 nodes, that scale, scaling out to there, uh, we can do an 1,100 cube total problem size in about 10 days. Um, the idea is that, that if we scale it to full size of the machine, it'll be a, a 1,200 cubed problem. So where are we going? Um, we've got a nice cross section of uh, algorithmic research that's still being done. A lot of this in the context of one of the Exascale co-design centers called Exact, and we're looking at changing the, the algorithms that go into these sorts of codes to be more uh, favor favoring compute over communication and memory traffic. We're looking at uh, optimizing the chemistry network in the context of reducing the working set size to reduce register pressure. Um, other alternate time integration schemes, more or less a whole, a whole suite of things where we will, we hope to realize future performance through algorithmic as, as well as implementation research. And just in conclusion, I figure we have a rework code that's, that's better in the sense that it's more flexible and more well suited to many core architectures as well as these hybrid GPU, CPU systems. So from the application standpoint, we're very pleased with that. Um, it also happens to perform fairly well on the, on the GPU, definitely better than, than two CPUs would. And, and we're pretty happy with that. So as soon as Titan's acceptance is complete, we'll be starting our first science runs. And we're sitting in this nice position where as NVIDIA releases new drivers, since Sir Dean talked about GPU Direct, that'll give us performance boost. Um, we hope with this code base we can sit back and wait and, and let some other people give us some more performance. And with that, I'd be happy to take any, any questions. Any questions for Ray? Okay, we're actually short on time, which is okay. Um, uh, if you have further questions, um, Ray, I don't know if you'll be available I'll for one-on-one. -on -one. roaming yeah. around for a while. Okay, perfect, perfect. Thank you so much, Ray. Coming up next will be Mr. Dirk Pleiter from uh, the ULIC Supercomputing Center to talk about the NVIDIA Applications Lab at ULIC, which was just established earlier this year. Stay tuned, thank you.